Hey, travel bosses. I'm excited to bring you this week's sponsor, Chipstreak, the smarter travel search. What I love about Chipstreak is the ability to search by personal preferences, such as preferring red eye flights only or only wanting lie flat seats. So the next time you need to book a flight, check out tripstreak.com slash travel like a boss. Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, the radio show all about traveling like a boss by being your own boss. Stay tuned for weekly interviews featuring guests that have built their own online businesses. If you would like to have access to our entire back catalog, visit travellikeabosspodcast.com for instant access. And here's your host, Johnny FD. Hey guys, it's Johnny and welcome to episode 151 of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. I'm here today with Desmond Landers. What's up? Not much, man. Thank you for having me. Man, I'm so glad you're on. So the... The kind of things I want to talk about today. So me and Desmond actually met at a documentary <laughs> screening of a movie called The 13th. Yep. If you guys haven't seen it, you can find it on Netflix. And this, the, the basis of it is slavery still exists today, but through jail and through just like criminalizing everything, especially things that target, not target, but I would say more minor, minorities, uh, blacks, Latinos end up in jail with. Right. And... I'm not going to get into that too much, but <laughs> one of the solutions that we had, we had a discussion about afterwards was, you know, instead of just, I don't say complaining, but just, you know, instead of just bringing up the facts that it's happening, because I think right. we all agree it's happening. Absolutely. I was asking, like, who has a solution? And you're probably the only person in the whole room that had, like, a concrete solution. And that was through, like, uh, an entrepreneurship empowerment. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I, and I think, you know, it, it's interesting that, that, that we met in that way. I had heard about all the great things that you were doing here. Um, and I hadn't gotten a chance to, to meet you in that, in that level. And I didn't know you that, that you were going to be there. And then we happened to be sitting up at something that's kind of unrelated to business and entrepreneurship, what we do day in and day out at an event like that. So it was great. But, um, yeah, I'm a big believer in family business, even, even at a micro level and creating an economic fortress for, for your family. Uh, you know, Many of us don't have the power to go change a lot of the institu- institu- institutionalization of things that's happening at a high macro level. But what you can do is you can create a, an economic fortress for your family that then creates opportunities in other areas of your life that can protect, right? Because the biggest thing that many of us can't do is, is well, two things. One, we don't count for our screw ups. Right. Yep. We, we, we plan our life as if things are going to go perfect. Mm-hmm. We plan for screw ups with getting insurance and this or, or that, but we don't plan for things like a buddy of mine last night got pulled over and he was going to be in jail for a few days. I got to call it midnight. I didn't even tell you this. Wow. I had to go as one of two people uh-huh. to get him out because he wasn't getting out. And we just had this conversation uh-huh. at the documentary screening. Yeah. This just happened 12 hours ago. And this happened to Ching Mai? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So I I'm, I'm gonna, I won't speak on who it is, but yeah. great guy. Yeah. It was an accident. Okay. But let me tell you what got him out of jail. Two things. Um, the ability to negotiate with uh, with the people there and, and, and money. That was the last thing that helped him walk out. And everyone skips over that. And then, and then and more importantly, it's the liquidity, mm-hmm. right? Because you can have a, a job or have money or whatever, but there's a difference between liquidity and replenishable income and savings. So a lot yeah. of people listening to this right now are thinking, you know, like, oh, well, I'm just not going to ever break a law so that it doesn't apply to me. But here's the, the crazy thing is nobody, everyone thinks that way until they end up breaking a law. <laughs> and it could be something like as simple as like you get into some kind of car accident or something, yeah. you accidentally drink and drive and I'm, I'm super against drinking and, you know, uh, drinking and driving so I, I would rather have people not do it in the first place Absolutely. but sometimes you just mess up you fuck up You're right. you know? and there's so many times I probably fucked up in my early 20s when I was a teenager yeah. that could have landed me in jail Right. and just it just didn't I just got lucky <laughs> same here same and, here yeah, <laughs> and everyone listening to this you know some of you might be on your high horse but I guarantee you you've done something stupid as yeah. a kid that you just got you just got away with you just got lucky and you know what's interesting about uh, about you your audience in this specific po- podcast travel like a boss we're not just talking about in the United States we're talking about traveling internationally because don't go to Singapore or come to Thailand and do certain things that you would do in the United States because they're they're permitted there but if you go to Singapore and you spill on the street or you don't flush the toilet these are ridiculous things or you have your window open and you're walking around naked these are laws written into Singaporean law. Yeah, you, you can, can go to you know jail, man. I didn't even know that law, and I walk around my my apartment and hotels naked all the time. And 
you can just accidentally, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, like just without even realizing, break a law. Absolutely. And when it happens, you have one or two choices. You can either, you know, be business minded and have the finance, you know, the finances to back it up and just get yourself out, mm-hmm. learn your lesson, and move forward, mm-hmm. or it could just bring you down a spiral and absolutely. financially destroy you. Absolutely. And not only the, destroy you financially, but also your time. Yeah. What happens if you get a few years in a jail that that is, uh, you know, because that's what my buddy was just faced mm-hmm. with. A few years in a jail that is international. We travel everywhere. Like these are not our native jurisdictions, right? So we don't innate, innately know everything that's going on. I've screwed up plenty of times. Um, so anyway, yeah, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, create taking the finances seriously and more than most people think is serious to protect yourself against the thing, the things that you cannot foresee or the things that we cannot foresee that we will probably mess up. That will get us in trouble. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And yeah. I, I think this, the statistics out there show that people who end up either with drug problems or homeless, it's not one thing that happened in Absolutely. their life. It's usually because pretty much all of us can handle, you know, one bad thing happening. I was getting fired. Yeah. Or a girlfriend break out with us right. or getting, you know, a speeding ticket or, you know, something. And if it's one by one, we deal with it. But when they start piling up <laughs> and for whatever reason, like it just, that just always happens, right? Right, right. Like everything's fine for two, three years Absolutely. and then one day everything just piles on. Absolutely. And you know what I've learned being an adult and I, I learned this from my dad and he was right is um, as an adult, I think all of us have at least that one major time in our life where stuff is just everything's going wrong all at the same time. And so, and so me personally, I've kind of seen glimpses of that uh, with, with personally and relatives. And so every day that when I wake up, I am every day preparing for that big time because uh, you know, now I'm thinking it's not a matter of, it's like starting a business. I have clients all the time ask me, well, what happens if this happens? I always tell them it will happen. The question is, are you prepared to get through it when it does? Mm. Right. That definitely makes sense. And I think, some people might still be thinking that's never going to happen to me. I guarantee it's going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's even if you just sat on your couch and you played video games all day, yeah. you smoked weed all day, yeah. and you're like, I don't bother anyone. I'll go out and do anything. Yeah, something's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> and if you have nothing in the bank to back it up, you don't have a network of friends who can bail you out. Yeah, we'll get you back on your feet, mm-hmm. and you just end up in jail for a dumb reason. You yeah. know, like. It could be as, as silly as smoking weed. Yeah. It could be as silly as... Which is a major offense in Thailand. Which is, yeah. It's, it's a major insane. offense. And like, you know, sometimes, you know, you like, you know, some people are thinking like, oh, I'll never be that stupid. Guess what? When you're here, you're out for a few drinks and then you meet some British backpacker. Absolutely. That's like, that had you a joint, you're out and you're drunk. You're like, oh, okay. And then you realize it's set up by, you know, by some shady cop or something. Absolutely. And you're in jail and you're like, oh crap, how that happened? And life gets real. Yeah. It's real not quick. all the fun and game. And you know, what's interesting, like... Um, I, I I hate to even admit this to you, but what what I've kind of rejected, and her at her brother and some other people I know kind of fall into this category: the solopreneur, the digital nomad, um, the freelancer, and and I get this whole life is great, let's be free, passive income, minimal work, enjoy my lifestyle. <laughs> I love the idea, but and and I'm not I'm not talking about every aspect of the idea, but that idea doesn't prepare you for the worst, which can happen like that. When I was living off of a six hundred dollar a month budget, it was fine if I didn't have any visa issues, if I didn't have Absolutely. to have, have a medical bill, yeah. if nothing my scooter didn't break. And thank God that I've you know overcome that now. Absolutely. But there was a very good chance I would have got stuck there. And I think that's kind of I don't want to say a warning for people because I don't want I don't want people just not to to do that at all because I think it's it's a you know, a great way to either bootstrap a business, hundred percent, learn some new skills, or just enjoy enjoy some traveling. Absolutely. But I do like your big picture thinking. Like your and and how old are you, by the way? Um, thirty one now. Okay. Yeah. So you grew up in Columbus, Ohio. You were living in Atlanta, Georgia, most recently. Yes. And you're out in Thailand. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Right. It's a blessing. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. And if you guys didn't uh, see the either the cover photo or you didn't. I don't, know. I don't know how if you guys didn't realize that Desmond is a black name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a black man. <laughs> and it's I I almost kind of feel like, and you, you can tell me if I'm wrong or not. No, it's all okay? good. I almost feel like half the people in the world or like l- l- let's just say black people, right? Yeah, yeah. Half people are, are like, man, Desmond got his shit together. Mm. He has a great business. You know, he you know, he's, you know, such a smart guy. He just like, he has he just his life together. Gotcha. And then I don't know if it's half, but a certain percentage of other people yeah. are like, fuck this dude. Yeah. 
for whatever reason. Yeah, absolutely. Did you ever have to go through that? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the first part of it is, hey, you got your life together, all that. You know, things are all relative. Everyone's got got you know skeletons in their closet. Everything's got things that. You know, that if everyone knew what they were doing at 24 hours, I think Warren Buffett said this. He said, if you trail, a, trail any car for 500 miles, any car will get a speeding ticket. If anyone is watched for any anybody for any longer period of time, they're going to get halts on something. Right. Mm-hmm. So so I think the big thing and I meant to say this at the event the other night is, you know, um, as we were standing up there kind of as a was kind of a micro representative of a, of a larger group of people back in the United States, uh, we're not special. We are not some chosen ones. Right. We just for whatever reason, we're able to kind of make it to here, but it doesn't really mean we make it out. I got to go back to the States. I, I'm going to raise a portion of, uh, of my family's life in the States. Um, I've still got family there that's still going through a lot of struggles. Right. Um, so it's not that I'm special or anything like that. Uh, and, and I think it's important for everybody to know that, you know, everyone is special. Everyone has unique traits. And I, and I, this is what I like about you. You're all about, everyone has something innately that they can contribute and do. And I'm a firm believer, but the second piece, yeah, I also get, get a lot of people that are like, that are reject the idea of, of taking care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself. You know, people are like, Oh, well, like I've got these people I can call, et cetera. Yeah. You have them until you don't. Maria always told me because I she always used to get on me driving. She's like, "You're up against that guy's bumper too much." I'm like, "Look, we got brakes." She's like, "You have brakes until you don't have brakes." Yeah, and that's true. I mean, that's deep, man. That's deep. <laughs> so Maria's his girlfriend she's standing right next to us. Hey, Maria. <laughs> uh, everyone that knows me knows Maria, by the way. Okay. Yeah, we're we're, we're, in, we're pretty inseparable. Separable. Yeah. So, you know, it, I think that's actually like a really deep quote because, <laughs> I mean, everything. Is fine until it's not, and yeah. and and it really is unpredictable. And that's with travel, yeah. that's with business, that's mm-hmm. with finances, that's with the law, Absolutely. and that's with anything, right? Absolutely. And I think a good trait for a lot of people is they do live in the moment and they take risks and they you know don't overthink it because if I over thought all this i never would have came to china yeah right right so it's kind of finding that balance what what like what made you take i don't want to say take a risk and come here but what made you come out here to be to be to be honest two things we we had already been traveling uh in uh, i'm just trying to say this in the most humble way possible uh we had already we've been to almost 35 countries already so traveling is something we've been doing for a very, pretty long time um and then we were spending so much time out of the country we said you know what we're cheating we've got we've got you know one one foot out and everything else in the United, the safety of the United States. We were like, well, why don't we just get immersed and figure out where to go and go live there? And then now we can be immersed in the culture. So, man, we looked at everything from uh, uh, Panama, Dominican Republic, basically the Caribbean. Then we looked at Chile and South America because we really enjoyed that, but it was kind of expensive. We didn't really want to do that. Um, and then we looked at a couple other places. We did, I didn't want to go to Europe because I'm not about the cold weather at all. Yeah, I, okay. I need sun. Like this shake my eyes amazing to me yep. it's like miami without a beach to me yep. right <laughs> <laughs> and a quarter of the price and a quarter of the price absolutely um and then you know her father actually has been um living down close to bangkok for the last 20 years and uh you know i think between him and her um that gave us the inspiration to say wow we could do it and i think that's important having someone in your family and i think this is what you preach if no one else in your family is doing it, you do it so that you can be the inspiration and in, in the example. And so fortunately, from a travel and an a expat standpoint, that's what we had. Now, the second thing that that I don't think many people talk about is we we have a fairly strong replenishable income source. I'm going to tell you right now, Johnny, I wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't have a strong income source because I, I'm a, I'm I'm. I'm a, I'm a risky entrepreneur. I'm all about identifying risk and really going out there above and beyond most people in terms of risk tolerance. I don't think I had the guts to come to another country if the money wasn't straight. You know what? It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so the two big topics I want to talk to you about today, yeah. the first part is getting over there, like the mentality of even starting a business and then being able to to take it out of the US or be able to travel with it. Yeah. And then second, I really want to kind of dive in a little bit with your business okay. so people have an idea of, you know, like what what they can potentially do to get started and what the kind of rewards are. Absolutely. So when like when did you actually leave leave the US like the first time? Uh the first <laughs> that's a funny story. That was 2006. I was on an internship from Ohio State University at a major investment bank and um I went to uh no you said the United States. I'm sorry. That's 2007. I went to work in London. Um, and I, I told the, the British guys the other day and they were like, dude, you're ridiculously crazy. Uh, long story short is I, I was the first in my family to leave the country period. Wow. When I told my dad, he said, no, you can't go. 
Okay. He said, you're not going, you shouldn't go. And I didn't understand what he was saying, but he was saying, I love you and I cannot protect you. Wow. He didn't know how to say it. What, what, right? is your, what was your, your childhood like? What, like, what were your parents like? Um, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, man. Uh, lower, uh, higher working class, mm-hmm. but we weren't middle. Okay. I don't ever want to confuse that. And I didn't know that until I was mid-teens. Mm. So I don't have this, um, and I kind of hate that this is publicized in the U.S., especially with black people. I don't have this project's welfare story. Mm-hmm. I don't, that's not me. Mm-hmm. But, I, I, you know, people always tell me when I went to college, even my other black peers, uh-huh. they were like, oh, you're so articulate. And you, you, you know, you, you just the way you do, you must have went to private school. Now, are you crazy? No, I didn't. Mm-hmm. I just had parents that, that didn't let their situation d- dictate mm. how they brought up their kids. Okay. That's important. Don't ever be a product, in my opinion, don't ever be a product in your environment unless the environment's positive. Okay. Yeah, that right? makes sense. I like that. And, and that's how they were. Um, you know, my dad is an artist, musician. Yeah. You know, he's not a huge person on capitalism. So he always taught me to, you know, he always said this to me, a black man will never be free in the United States if he does not own his own business. Now, most mm-hmm. people are not going to sit up here and say that, but that's just, I'm just telling you, that's what I was taught, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm an entrepreneur now. And I understand now as, an, as a man and an adult why he said that. Uh, my mom was a you know a little bit more of the stable one, more traditional insurance for thirty years, and um, together you know they made it work. But man, I have so much respect for them. Mm-hmm. Just parents in general that mm-hmm. can keep together a family, especially if things are not always going right. Okay. But that's how I grew up. Um, I didn't quite realize that we didn't have a lot of the things that that we had the basic needs, uh-huh. but there was just above the basic needs that that probably other families had uh-huh. that we didn't have. Okay. Like I never had a house. Ever, okay. until i was you know in sophomore year in college so you guys all did you live in like a, a rental house or an apartment yeah apartment okay and, and a, i'm thankful for that for the fact that we had housing uh-huh. but there were certain things i couldn't do i couldn't play little league football uh-huh. because my parents we just mentally they were so drained just trying to make ends meet that even basic things that sound stupid and she teases me all the time she's like that really affected i did because all my friends see i didn't play football until i was a sophomore in college yeah. so if you know i thought when you go hit a guy he's the only one that gets hit i'm talking about on the football field okay yeah i didn't know that when you hit a guy and you run full speed into him as a defensive back or whatever that uh-huh. it hurts you too oh but these guys knew how to tackle yeah they knew the technique because they've been playing since they was four or five yeah. years old so i uh, you know for me that's something that I just wanted to be able to provide for my kids the basics and let's, let's remove money from the conversation, you know, and I'm sorry to be talking so much on this particular topic, but, um, my family was a a bit divided and, you know, one of my siblings and my, one of my parents didn't get along for a long period of time. And do you know that, that money was a, a driving factor in enabling them to come together in an environment in a very nice environment that otherwise my family couldn't have afforded. And get back together? Like well, what, what happened? Yeah, and get, get back together. There was just a falling out. Okay. And, um, and I've been a part of them too in my family, many of us probably, uh, but it was a falling out for multiple years. And we were, we had been working on, it was like working on a deal, man. I was like trying to get this side to come, trying to get this side to come. And we were able to create an environment in Atlanta just a few months ago where everyone had amazing time. Um, we spent a lot of money. They didn't know that. We funded it. They didn't oh, know wow, that. Okay. But they, but, that environment created so much joy. Yeah. Okay. You know, forget the money. It was the fact that the joy created and the ability to do that without having to worry about penny pinching. Yeah. And now they're talking again. Well, you know what's crazy is when my grandfather passed, instead of giving the money to his seven kids, <laughs> which if you divide it up, it would be, you know, let's say 10 grand like a child. Absolutely. Which is okay, but they'll probably just use it and like, a, you know, pay off some bills Absolutely. or something. Yeah. But he would have the foresight. He said, you know what? When I'm gone, I don't want this family to stop meeting and having a central place to meet. Absolutely. So what he did was he put that 70000 in a fund that is only to be used yeah. for family gatherings of more than like for, for the, the siblings. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. So I think like- That's beautiful. Three, you know, two, three times a year, yep. everybody gets together for like a big dinner. Absolutely. And then, you know, you, you're like, thanks, grandpa. Right. <laughs> and then nobody has to fight for the bill. Nobody has to like worry about- like, oh, uncle, blah, 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 is cheap. You know, he never pays. Absolutely. Or, you know? <laughs> right. And you know what? What you just described to me, that's the pinnacle of what money can do for a family, right? Because now we can remove a distraction. Money, it, a lot of times, can just be a distraction. Mm-hmm. But, but it's the tool for trade, right? So if everyone wants to assemble on a plate, she actually has, um, she's trying to solve this problem with her family right now. And what we've just determined is we're just going to have to fund it. So that the distraction can be removed from the situation. So, that, and we're actually doing this March fifteenth. We're going to Miami nice. for a whole week. A good portion of that we're funding, right? And and not that they can't, but it's it's the goal is not the money. The goal is to be together as a unit and to celebrate. She's celebrating her her deceased you know brother. That's a beautiful thing. That should be celebrated and in an environment in which everyone's happy. 
Um, if, if money can enable that and do what your grandfather had the foresight to do, I think the world would be a better place. Yeah, I, I definitely think that. And it's like, it's crazy that there's this, this thing about money where on half the side, people are like, money's evil. The other half, it's like it's so much opportunity, mm-hmm. and maybe it's a little bit of both. Where it, it money brings out whatever someone's intentions are, yeah. you know. And uh, I personally hate dealing with other people and, and, and money just because it like half the time you just like, oh man, I really wanted to like this guy, <laughs> but now I see he's like, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it can be challenging. The best thing to do is if everybody had enough money for themselves, absolutely, you wouldn't even have, even have these arguments. Man, you're telling the truth. You yeah. Know? So okay, so let's. Let's get back to the kind of the early days. You know, you grew up, you you know, uh, you went to Ohio State. Yeah. How did you get into online business? What what made you decide to build your own business? Uh, well, the first thing was um, the the first driver was my dad. That's the first. Second was that my mom was just supportive and wanted us to be happy. So it all starts there. Um, if I didn't hear this stuff every day, I, I would not be the person I am today. Uh, whatever little bit that is, right? But in just terms of mentality of entrepreneurship, um, I incorporated my first business when I was 18, actually. Wow. So it's 13 years. So I've been doing this, um, I've been doing this for a long time. Like, and I'm not saying that for any other reason other than my heart is in trying to conquer this. Yeah. And what connected me with you is, and I didn't even see the article myself, but Maria was reading the article and you were saying that, and I think I told you this the other night, you came to a crossroads a few years ago where it, it got really real. And it was like, okay, do I pursue my dream? Or do I listen to the lack of some of the lack of support I have at home, give in, throw in the town, go do something that I'm not called to be doing. Right. I said, I told her we were sitting at Zoe in yellow. I said, I don't, I haven't read that article, but I got to meet the guy Mm -hmm. because of that, because that's real. And, and, you know, kind of without getting off track here, I started my first company when I was 18. It's a real long story. I had a lot of failure, Mm -hmm. a lot of failure. I went through about a hundred thousand dollars in the debt. I borrowed, I put my, uh, yeah. See, like, you know, when you talk about people being real, yeah. Um, I don't just look at people having a lot of money being real. My, I, what I want to know is what did you sacrifice and give up to get where you got, even if all you got is 10 grand in the bank? Because, you know, if, if that person that is willing to sacrifice, put in 20, 22 hour days, put their own money up with the bank or their family says no, that's real, right? Because yeah. a lot of people aren't willing to do that. And you're willing to persist through that. That person is going to find success or even get a, a second job to be able to fund and bootstrap your business and work till midnight every night. hundred yep. percent. Work on weekends instead of watching Netflix. Yeah. So, so well, f- first off, how did you even get the hundred grand to go into debt with? Well, no, no, no. Well, so this is over a period of time. <laughs> okay. Right? So this is from 18 to 26. Okay. Um, so a uh, good portion of the money is I funded it through customer revenue a little bit, you know, 15, 20, mm-hmm. uh, 30,000 from businesses. I borrowed, um, at, fortunately I was a student, so I could borrow student private, loans. private loan, dude. There you go. Yeah. Um, what type of business was this? Uh, so my first business was a, um, I, now I sound so sophisticated for 18, but basically an IT consulting business. Okay. And, and the goal was in high school, I was fortunate enough to go to a high school that had a Cisco certification, Oh wow. Um, okay. you know, to put together routers. So at 16, I could literally wire this building and make all the computers talk to what each other. What made you want to do that? What made you want to learn that? Oh, my dad. Okay. My dad, being in music in the late 80s, um, he found that music was going digital. Uh. Uh, he plays keyboard. He's a producer, etc. And he was so used to doing everything analog that he he started dragging me to CompUSA, Micro Center. I don't know if you remember the names yeah, of the yeah. stores, right? Um, when I was really young. And then I was just immersed in, in technology. He said, Desmond, you got to learn this because this is where things are going. I have to learn this because I love my craft and I can't do it the way I was doing it. So now I got to learn this. And my dad got into computers. And then I got into computers. Man. That's how that went. <laughs> you know, I, I bet a lot of people are thinking like, man, you got lucky, you know, that you had a, you had supportive parents, they instilled the right business mindsets in you. And then they also happened to be savvy enough to kind of spot the trend of, of tech. Gotcha. And then some people might be listening, thinking like, I don't, I didn't, I didn't have that, you know, right, right. you know, and then maybe even use that as an excuse on why they're not successful today. Yeah. If we can give like, are there any like books or anything that, that you've read since then that you like, you know what, if I had read this when I was 16 or whatever it was, yeah. I could have had a similar mind so I could still, you know, like learn some of those lessons. I'm going to tell you this. There's yeah. one person that has really changed my life uh, in, in, uh, in the last five, six years. And had I known these things when I was 18, dude, I can't tell you where I'd be. Grant Cardone. You know what? I I, uh, <laughs> I really like his book, 10X Rule. Yeah. I'm sure you've listened to that uh, or you read I, it. I actually haven't listened to 10X. I actually read all the other books. But I've but I actually I but I've actually been to Cardone's office. I've met wow. Cardone. Okay. I, I'm, I'm in contact with Jared. Okay. Like, yeah. So like we invest a lot of a good amount of money with him. 
Um, and you know, I, I think like taking his courses or like courses, the, the sales training university, okay. going to the events in Mexico, like, Oh, we're all in. Wow. That's I'm crazy. all about oh, that. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So had I been exposed to training like that, actually, I think a couple of things as an entrepreneur, um, that, that someone needs to know is the first thing is ethics. Yeah. Ethics is very important, right? Ethics first, second selling. Yeah. And don't ever forget it. You got to sell in order to generate revenue, right? Yeah. People are like, oh, I'm not a salesperson. Oh, I don't, I don't want to sell. But you but you were just selling me an idea on politics. Uh -huh. You were surely just sitting in that employer's office selling about why you should get the job over this next candidate. Mm -hmm. So let's not talk about why you're not a salesperson because if you keep doing that, you're doing yourself, your family a disservice. Yeah. You know, so, so that's how I feel about that. Second is sales. Um, the third thing I would say, and this is probably not in the exact third order, but what I, I say is people should probably, I think, focus on service businesses. Yeah. Now, I think the evolution of that is online marketing, internet marketing. Uh -huh. I actually don't consider myself an internet marketer. Okay. I, I consider myself just generally an entre entrepreneur yeah. because what I find, what I see with a lot of internet marketers is that, um, you know, um, they have many gaps in their skill set, right? Marketing in, is just the acquisition component of a business, right? But there's infrastructure, mm -hmm. licensing, insurance, contracts, accounting, right? People like you got to know this stuff. Like in, in, in our lodging business, we're in five states. I got to know the state jurisdiction. I got to know the, the county jurisdiction. I have to have an attorney in every state. I got to pay taxes in every state. You know what I'm saying? Like, because um, it's just very important. Yeah. So, so. And this the, is like a, this is a real business. This, this is, is uh, yeah, know. this, yeah. And, and to kind of just briefly describe what lodging is, because some people might be thinking logging so, or something. Yeah. <laughs> what, what we do, uh, so, so, uh, so my specialty is in service-based businesses, which right. is different from online marketing, right? Uh, my skill set is being able to identify a unique um, service that can be offered to a demographic to solve a problem, mm -hmm. build a unique brand around that, build the entire infrastructure from A to Z, not okay. just the website, the A to Z, the contracts, the financial, the break-even points, like all yeah. that sales process, all that. Okay. Um, and then present that to the marketplace and grow from scratch. Okay. Um, and that's what we did with this business. This our lodging business has done 1.7 million in the last three years or something like okay. that. So like, yeah, if like a musician or like a traveling like circus act needs hotels, you know, around the U.S., that's something that that you can help them with, or, yeah. or like this, like a similar type business. Absolutely. Okay. So, so that business, the business model is pretty simple. We go to uh, hotel hotels like a Spring Hill Suites or Marriott uh, uh, or Homewood Suites, and we say, hey, I want to lease your hotel room the same way you lease an apartment for two or three years at a time. Wow. Okay. Give me a significantly discounted rate for that guaranteed business. You give me the rate, I'll send you a lump sum check every single month. Okay. And then what we do is we sell subscriptions back out to super commuters. Mm -hmm. Super commuters are a very small portion of the work population that actually travel by plane, uh, train, or, or driving. Okay. More than two to three plus hours per day to their destination to get to work. Okay. So so that's super commuters are a specific group in that business. I can see, I see that. So I think right now some people are thinking like, man, this is like a big legit business it's decent so yeah, like, like, like the what, amount of work yeah. that it takes day in and day out is not dude i wish i could wake up and have money in my inbox yeah. all that 1.7 million but maria and i we literally fought for it in 300 dollars increments over okay. the phone phone sales and when, yeah. when, you, when you when you say 1.7 million is that total revenue or was that yeah yeah total revenue for from the last couple of years that we've been operating that particular business wow, i was cool. just i'm just summarizing yeah. right but I, I showed you the statements from the last couple yeah. months or you know what's actually yeah. funny is you're the only guest who's like came super prepared you like came and got a you had a like a nice haircut <laughs> you have a buttoned up shirt maria told you me to have... respect johnny's podcast get a haircut <laughs> As in here is shorts. I'm I'm leaving Chiang Mai uh, in two days, so I have like go, like bags of just stuff I'm throwing away, donating. So this place is a mess. Sorry, Facebook Live. <laughs> That's all good. It's all good. But it's you know what? Here's here's something I want to put out there is I think one of the reasons why you are so successful is because you go above and beyond not only what is needed for business, but maybe even what's expected out of you or what everyone around you is doing because I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things in the US but also around the world yeah. that you know are disadvantaged to either black people or someone who grew up you know that didn't get money handed down from the parents Absolutely. or you know all these other things right and like and that could be a 5 hour podcast <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a why me grow up as a as an Asian American to immigrant parents, Absolutely. or you know, you grow up as a black kid, how that could have held, held us down. But Absolutely. I'd rather spend those five hours figuring out what can we, you know, even if that's true, yeah. what can we do to build ourselves up would be better. Absolutely, yeah. And and, and the one thing I want to say, and I think I said this the other day, is you know, um, with, with with black people in particular, we I mean, we have a real a real life struggle in the United States, and it's and it's a bad 
But what I also say is there are also other uh, oppressed groups. You could easily fit into that group. You're not you as, as who you are, but Asian American immigrant parents. I heard you say this the other day. Your life is just bad. It could have been, I don't know your full story with that, but I, basically all I'm saying is my starting point doesn't really seem to be any different than your starting point. But if people had the video, well, Maria's got the video going live. If they look at our skin color, you're much lighter than me, right? Like, like in America, like Asians are like looked at as like the smart people. I mean, that's just how it is. But I, but, but maybe with your story, it's just as hard as mine. So I'm not saying that it, that it's a black thing. For me, it's really not. It's really how do you build an economic, sustainable economic fortress for your family, regardless of what your color is, regardless of what profession, interest, um, or life goals you have. It, it doesn't matter. And if yeah. anything, even if we have to work 20% harder, or yeah. we have to be 20%. I don't want to say be 20% smarter, but work 20% smarter. Yeah. And that's what that's, it is. That's what we got to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you go into an environment, um, you, you know, they all, the old saying is don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Mm -hmm. If you know you're in a gunfight, mm -hmm. bring a gun. Yep. Or if you, or, you know, if you're playing basketball, don't bring a football to the basketball court. Man, it's the wrong tool for the game. Yep. All right. You know? And so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just fully agreeing with you. But uh, I think entrepreneurship and is the way it goes. Here's what I, what I will say. Um, and I hope no one gets offended about this, but I do think it is important for online marketers, internet marketers, lifestyle entrepreneurs to have two things. One, um, you, you know, they need to be well-rounded because think about this. Most internet marketers, most people wouldn't hire them to be a CEO. Think about that. Chief executive officer, you got to handle every aspect mm -hmm. of the business. I might hire you to be head of acquisition, but that's one piece of this business. Mm -hmm. I got a supply chain I got to deal with. Mm -hmm. I got better business bureau stuff I got to deal with. I got uh, financing. I got to go get lines of credit. Do you know how to go to procure? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Right. And because because once these guys, you know, women and, and men make all this money or have this great lifestyle, one of a few things are going to happen. Either you're going to be so uberly successful that you're going to want to get into other things. Mm -hmm. You may not stay an expat and be able to live for cheap your whole life. You may have to go back to the stage or go help family. Right. Mm -hmm. That game never changed whether you left or not. Right. So you have to go back into that game well rounded with depth. Right. I mean. You know, many, many, many online marketers, they can't pick up a phone and, and close somebody on a transaction. Oh, my, if my website didn't, why is it not working? Pick up the phone and call the customer and understand what was on that website that, that turned them off, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's why I, I am really happy I started with e-commerce yeah, and not affiliate marketing or some other kind of online only absolutely. marketing yeah. because products. I had to, you know, <laughs> I had to build a website, I had to like, find, you know, source products, absolutely. I had to call suppliers. Yep. And it was awkward. It's, yeah. it's like, I'm calling, you know, these, you know, like medium sized companies in the US. Right. You know, they've been established for 20, 30 years. Right. I've used their brands in the past. Right. So I knew, like, you know, they probably get calls from people all the time. Right. And they don't want to waste their time working with someone who is sitting in board shorts in Thailand <laughs> that's never started a business before. <laughs> right. So I had to be really confident on the phone. You know, yeah. and they ask me questions like, you know, how are you going to do with the customer service? Absolutely. Or, you know, you have to be on point with that. Absolutely. And when I would get a, email at two in the morning which is here is you know whatever 8 a.m back home or just day, daytime back home yeah yeah and i wanted that sale because i was bootstrapping the business mm -hmm. i would get on the phone and call mm -hmm. two three four in the morning right trying to just pretend i'm awake preach and be like you know <laughs> hey i see that you know you have an abandoned shopping cart right <laughs> you know, you know uh, why did you leave yeah, please come back is, is there anything i could do to, to help you with your order right, right and i was on the phone hustling <laughs> yep and that's why even today and that's I, why you can you know, put on something like nomad summit or be the guy you are here because you're willing to do things that they're not willing to do and i wonder why other people aren't willing to do it what i found johnny yeah. is that a lot of times they're not willing to do it one of, because of one of two things either they're they can rely on someone else yeah. I, i'm meeting a lot of people here in thailand that can make a phone call and they can have money in their account mm -hmm. i can't johnny it's me i got i've, I've got to have my own back i gotta have my back for her yeah right um, so if, if you can make a phone call and it's not a bad thing, it's a great thing, but, it, but it's a crutch. Yep. Don't, don't fool yourself thinking if I can call mommy or daddy, or I can call my uncle or I can call my sister and get money. That's not a business and it's not sustainable. And I see people here that are saying, Oh, that's just, no, it's not because it will run out. They will get sick of wiring you the money. Uh, that's one. Or the second thing is your why is not big enough. Mm -hmm. See Johnny, like, you know, that, that business is done, done a little bit. Um, but, but. You know, we're about to launch our car share company, right? We're in three different industries. We're in residential cleaning, we're in lodging, and we are in uh, about, uh, in the car business, mm -hmm. right? Um, every one of these businesses takes significant startup capital. Um, they take uh, a lot of convincing 
of of traditional like I got to convince a bank to give me a line of credit to finance 30 vehicles wow. 2017s man yeah. this is uh, this is like these are my vehicles $800 a month per uh-huh. vehicle I'm on the hook for as we scale like I got real expenses uh-huh. got to hire people same as you right I'm just saying but I'm, I'm definitely str- not the same as me I don't well, have no, one no, vehicle <laughs> <laughs> no 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 I'm just saying expenses I'm yeah. I'm not saying I'm the only one I'm just saying um I often you know show me someone who's got 40k a month in expenses mm-hmm. and who's been able to manage that sustainably because the level that you got to operate under or 50 or 100k and i your buddy is is his name's chris Chris, yeah man he said look man because you were telling me about him and i he was pulling me aside he said look i haven't met a guy doing real real numbers who's not working his ass off every day in some capacity um so so i think the the why has got to be big right if your why is only me 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 travel live my lifestyle that's cool but when your life changes, why don't you just prepare now why things are cushy while it's just about you? Because because everyone who doesn't have their own immediate family probably will in the next few years at some point in our peer group. So now it's not just about you. Now you're going to have to start getting a little bit more serious. Mm-hmm. A wife, we're going to get married, right? I got to make sure she's taken care of. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> Kids are going to start popping out. She wants like five of them. How many do you want? Yeah, like, okay, they're going to be expensive. Okay. Right? They got, yep. um, but the bigger thing is I, I see this happy-go-lucky mentality, and it's only happy-go-lucky until life hits you. The thing is, why don't you just pre- – two, two things. Prepare why things are easier now, mm. one, and make your why bigger. Because, look, if you don't make, if you don't do it, life is going to make your why yep. bigger. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like people's year, monthly or yearly expenses never go down. <laughs> they go up. They, they only go, go up, up right? This. Yeah. I and mean, that's crazy. Yeah. And economics is just not built for it to go down anyway with yeah. inflation. So don't even kid yourself about it. And there's only so many cheap places you can move before it's like you went to the cheapest place. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? And I did that. I, I read a book called The World's Cheapest De- Destinations. Yeah, yeah. Tim LaFell. And I remember just having that mentality. I'm like, okay, I can live here because it's cheap. I can live here because it's cheap. Right. And I almost got stuck in Thailand okay. because I was like, you know what? I'm just going to live as cheap as possible till my money runs out. Gotcha. Money started running out. Gotcha. Called my cousin. was like, hey, can I borrow some money? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right, right. And, right. and he was the richest guy that I knew. Got you know, it. he, you know, he... Had a nice government job. He was making 100K. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah, it'd be easy for him to send me a couple grand to <laughs> spot me for a few months. And because we have a good relationship, he was like, he's like, yeah, I, I can, I can, you know, lo- loan to you, but you have to give me a month to, to, to gather it. And I was like, gather it? What do you mean? <laughs> I thought you make 100 grand a year. <laughs> right, right. I'm like, do you just have that? Can you please go deeper into what you're saying? Well, here's Liquidity, the thing is, man, is means something. I just assume <laughs> anyone who's making 100 grand has. A hundred grand in the bank, or at least ten grand, yeah, right? Like yeah. to me, why wouldn't you have ten percent of your income just in a bank somewhere, in a savings account, or somewhere? Absolutely. And it blew my mind when he when he said he didn't have it. Dude, people aren't liquid. People are like, oh, I can, oh, I can go to the if I I don't have to do that. I can go to yeah. the bank or I can call relatives. When they say no, what do you do? Yeah. Or it, or if you incur a life event that is above your disposable cash flow mm-hmm. for that period, right? What do you do? That's real. And it happens and it messes people's life up. Even people that are making 100, 150, 200K, because it really don't matter if you're not keeping the money, mm-hmm. right? You're getting taxed 35% on that. So you're making 65. That's fifty. That's $5,500 a month take home. Where are you living? If you're making 100K, there's probably some peer pressure. Well, one, you probably, if, if you're in corporate, it pro- you're probably late 20s, early 30s. Statistically, that shows you're probably married, one or two cars, probably a mortgage, right? I mean, just statistically. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What are your living expenses? And then, in America, unfortunately, we have the peer pressure of okay, I'm in that hundred K club. I gotta live this way. You can't yeah, do can't it like you're going to no Thailand. Hyundai. Yeah, right. You know, eight hundred dollar a month Ben's uh, car note. Yeah, they, they, they don't have the money. Yeah. So I have a huge question that everyone's thinking <laughs> is how are you managing this this big business yeah. while traveling? We set it up. We so that this particular lodging business has been in operation. We just celebrated four years in business uh, a few days ago. Um, for the first three and a half years. Uh, we basically sacrificed everything and we got all the systems together. Fortunately, we built a model that actually relies on the hotels. Uh-huh. So basically, you know, when, when you kind of look at the, the maintenance of a room, um, one, you got to have the room, but two, it's the check-in, check-out process. Mm-hmm. It's the cleaning. It's the ma- management maintenance when something goes wrong. Um, I didn't want to get into tr- to traditional real estate because I didn't want to be bogged and tied down mm-hmm. to having to be a landlord. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, and this goes back to kind of thinking more like a, and I'm not saying this as a, you know, 
any other thing than just to describe it holistically is you got to think like a CEO. Mm. Okay. If I look at my supply chain, here are my supply options. I could do this business model in someone's home. Mm. Well, there's certain uh, jurisdictional issues like occupancy law, et cetera. Um, or I could do this um, in corporate housing units, or I could do this um, in, in, in a hotel. They all have their pros and cons. Mm-hmm. But what I knew is I did not want to be shackled by my business. So I chose this supplier model. That's smart. And that, thank goodness, enabled us to break away and say, hey, we're leaving. But honestly, I didn't know we were coming to Thailand three years ago. I had no idea. All I knew is I wanted to build business businesses that once they got to a certain level, I could kind of leave yeah. them to start the other that's what i had that makes sense yeah and that's that's freedom absolutely you know absolutely. i think the, the probably the best thing about people in town and already who are building a business is it forces us to do that from day one yeah it does it does <laughs> <laughs> it does but it's good that you had the foresight to think of that anyways yeah i think you know a lot of people can learn from this if you guys are back in the u.s or back home wherever you are mm-hmm. if you're going to build a business mm-hmm. start thinking of it as is this something that i can eventually do from overseas or outsource or automate. Yeah. And that's, that's genius of you. Cause I think a lot of people were like, Oh yeah, I want to, I want to provide housing for, you know, um, for super commuters. Yeah. Let me rent a bunch of apartments. Maybe I can hire a, um, a maid that comes by. Right. And right. Then these things work, especially if you're there, you can, you can watch them. Right. But what, what, what happens if your maid gets sick when she gets on the job and you got to find another one, but you're in Thailand, what are you going to do? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know, um, we pay a, a premium for it, but we push that, uh, that work onto our hotel partners. That's smart. And you know what? Like, when it comes down to it, as long as the business is profitable and someone else is taking care of that day to day, yeah, yeah, you can just scale it up, dude. And I think me. a lot of people don't think about that. They They're don't. like, I can make more money if I just did, you know, if I just cleaned the rooms myself, or I just be one myself, yeah, you know, or if I had my brother do it because they don't think about money right. Yeah, they they have the totally inc- incorrect thing, way about thinking about money because they're not thinking about the future value of the potential 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 earnings. Right, what you just described is them creating their own trap. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, I make good money now, but that's not all the money you're going to need. <laughs> and that trap is probably better than working at a normal corporate job. Or- Dude, hundred <laughs> percent. Let me tell you something about me, and 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 um, people think this is baffling. Man, I would decline a hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year corporate job to make thirty thousand years an entrepreneur any day of the week. Wow. Any day. And I'm talking about living in America. I'm not talking about living in uh-huh. Thailand. I'm talking about living in America any day of the week. Wow. I think entrepreneurship is really the um the seeking of of purpose and fulfillment through commercial means. Mm. So if if your time and your seeking of personal fulfillment and value is greater than than money uh-huh. you can say stuff like that. yep and a lot of people are like oh man i don't care about money man you reduce that guy's salary ten thousand dollars see what, yeah, how much yeah. he cares about money <laughs> or you ask him for a thousand bucks and see how much he yeah, cares about that's it. true he'll, he'll look at you like are you crazy yeah so you know i think the, the, the money is being taught wrong money's not bad money's a piece of paper mm-hmm. you know and i actually i, I was having conversations with here people people talking about bartering and all that i don't think bartering is good at all mm-hmm. i think bartering is a very inefficient means of trade yeah which is why currency came about yep Right, so it's not money is the issue; it's the fact that we don't understand money. In my opinion, no, I, I, yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, and that's, I, it's crazy because in Chiang Mai, there's it has a reputation <laughs> of you know of people bootstrapping, which bootstrapping itself is great, yeah, absolutely. But bootstrapping, as in a sense, I don't even want, I don't call them bootstrapping. I want to say <laughs> p- cheap people living in Thailand. <laughs> All right. Got it. Got and it. for a long time, that is what attracted us to Chiang Mai because it's low cost of living. Uh, that's why expats come here to retire. Yeah. And that's why people like coming just to chill. Absolutely. And you know, and if you want to chill, chill. That's Absolutely. fine. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. But if you say you want to be an entrepreneur, you say you are an entrepreneur, or yeah. you have the title CEO on your Twitter, right? You better not just be chilling. Yeah. <laughs> trying to barter, working, spending two hours bartering with someone about something yeah. when you could just pay for the service mm-hmm. and then someone could pay for your service. Absolutely. Yeah. Time is more valuable than money. I can always get more money in some way. I can't get my time back. And I, I almost don't think if I traded my service to someone, I'm going to get good quality work. Because if someone's <laughs> yeah, willing to do that. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's, what I, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not efficient. Because how do you measure it? And then as it creates this uncomfortable situation, it's like, like, dude, you screwed up my website. Well, yeah. dude, you didn't pay for it. Yeah. yeah I would try to pay you for it. Yeah. You wanted to barter. You, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So I understand. So I, I definitely agree with that. So let's take a step back again. Okay. <laughs> because I think a lot of people are like, man, this sounds fantastic. Because... I'm really glad that not only did I meet you, but that you came on because you're Same representing here. Same here. an entire different <laughs> genre of, of entrepreneurs in Chiang Mai. Gotcha. Because uh, there, there's this reputation that most people here are broke. They're, you know, they're, they don't, they're not building real business, yeah. but there are people like you 
who are attracted to Chiang Mai for whatever reason. Why, why did you come here? You know, um, two things. One was pers- uh, three things. Uh, my dad always preached that um, just because you were born in a country doesn't mean by default that's your home country. Mm-hmm. You could very well, and this is not even a, even a race thing. It's not, it's not about where your origins go. It's where are you happy? Mm-hmm. Where are you treated the best? Where do you like your family to live? I actually think I'm going to raise a family in Thailand. Wow, nice. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. we're, here, we're here for the, the long term. Yeah. So, so number one is my dad always said, you know, um, don't just limit yourself to the United States geographically, mm-hmm. number one. Number two, uh, we were already traveling a lot. We wanted to immerse ourselves. Thailand ended up being uh, the best thing. And the funny thing is her brother, I just found yeah. out, who's, who's you're going to love, I think. Okay. I think he fits in with this community like crazy. He's in Miami. Um, he's going to move here with his girlfriend and, and live here because he's seen us do it. Right. And I think you guys are going to spark kind of a trend almost. Well, I mean, I think you did it already. <laughs> Everyone, yeah. I saw your videos like, and I didn't even know it was you. That's a funny thing. I uh. saw your videos like maybe six, nine months ago. I was like, hold on. That's him, dude. I saw his videos when you were, um, I don't know where it was, but like the furniture you had was was like brown and uh. probably one of your other service apartments that yeah. you were in kind of earlier on. Uh-huh. And I just, you were just cool as hell. You know what I'm saying? So when I saw that and you and other people that were on there, I was like, okay, I think we can do this. You know what's crazy is when I, when I made those videos, uh, if you guys haven't seen it, go on my YouTube channel, look for Johnny FD. And I think they're called, there's two that I think most people find. One is my $200 a month apartment. Another one is my $400 a month yeah. apartment. <laughs> and I was just so like, just happy to share it. Absolutely. Because I was like, Check this out, because right. I was paying, you know, fifteen hundred living in LA. Absolutely, a, you know, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a bad place. Yeah, but this place was as good or better. Absolutely, I had, I didn't have to have roommates. Right, you know, I had like, um, you know, someone come once a week to clean the place. Right, right. It was like walking distance to everything. I had to drive. I had to deal with, you know, traffic. Right. And I was like so happy to find it. I wanted to share that with people. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. It's a hidden gem. And, and I would have had no idea. Honestly, on our trip in July, you know, uh, a couple years ago, we came to Bangkok. We thought we fell in love with Bangkok. Then we came back to, the, in July. We hate Bangkok. Yeah. And then I was like, there's got to be somewhere else in Thailand to yeah. live. We bounced around to Phuket and we bounced around to Pattaya, um, a couple other places. And then we stumbled. We almost didn't even come to Chiang Mai. Wow. We fell in love as soon as we got off the plane. Yeah. It's crazy how you could just miss stuff. Yeah. Um, the third reason why we moved is, is, and this is, I think, is a very critical. It's a part of a greater plan for our family economically. Mm. Yeah. For two reasons. One. I want to do business in Asia. I want to do business in Dong. I want to do business in Bot. I want to do business in Peso. Wow, okay. Legit. Okay. And yeah. have real physical businesses in these countries. Okay. Because I think diversification of your income stream outside of your home country, I think it's very important. Okay. I think it's critically important. Um, and um, yeah, the other, th- yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Okay. But I think people need to look at, oh, an increasing runway. Uh-huh. Look, I mean, our numbers are okay, right? Uh-huh. But if I can eat and live and hire people and have an amazing experience doing all the same stuff I was doing, not yeah. missing a beat. And my runway doubles, triples, or quadruples. Uh-huh. If you're a real entrepreneur, man, you're looking for every way mm. to increase your runway because you need the buffer. That makes sense. And runway is a critically important point that I don't think um, people that are entrepreneurial understand. So you if you, yeah. It. yeah. So if you guys don't have enough money to float your business for what, three, four, five, Five months? Yeah, at least, man. Yeah? At least, okay. you know. Um, you probably have different perspective on it than I do. In, in our businesses, you know, it takes, if we hit the right one, okay. right? This is and, and that's hard enough for people to do. But if we hit the right one, like with our lodging business, we broke even in five months or less. We broke even in five months. We turned profitability in month six. Nice. Uh, we almost went about out of business in month three. Wow. I'll tell you that okay. right off, offline. It wasn't bad, but it, we just almost did. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say that even a year, if mm-hmm. you can. And, and when that year starts, man, hit the ground running yep. because it really could be 18 months. You don't know. And then try to always create ways not to just live down, but also create ways to grow that income. Even if you got to do something here in, in, in Thailand or whatever it is to increase your runway because everyone's all, they're penny pinching, they're bot pinch. I'm like, dude, uh, you wouldn't be fighting over this stuff in America. It's three pen- It's yeah. 30 cents. Why are we talking about 20 bot? I, I get it. But the reason why people are talking about that, and I'm not knocking it. I'm just uh, hoping that someone will be inspired by this and say, let me think differently, is how do I go create more? Yep. Because then I don't have to worry about it. I think every single person should know how much they're worth per hour and then not waste time doing anything. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. <about us. laughs> yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. I agree like, with that. I don't like getting ripped off. So that I'll fight for, yeah. even though it's irrational. Uh, no, it's not. You know, yeah. but it's principle. That's different. Yeah, that's principle. Yeah. 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 But if something costs... 30 cents more and, I, and that's just the price it's marked yeah and I, it saves me 20 minutes I'll just buy that absolutely 100% yeah. 100% yeah. 
hundred percent. I I agree. Can can we? Um, do you think that that the audience uh, they're extremely intelligent? I know, but um, I'm not sure if you guys talk about this often. Do you think that folks kind of know the simple calculation of runway? Or you know what, I, I would love to hear because you're actually one of the first guests I've had on to talk about even needing runway because oh, <laughs> most of the the entrepreneurs I have on they bootstrap their businesses. And, and, and there's pros and cons of both, right? Actually, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you that in a second because for me, I'll, even today, even though I have cash in the bank, absolutely, I don't like starting businesses that might cost me money. <laughs> Johnny. Yeah. And you know what? Maybe it's holding me back, <laughs> no, right? No, 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 no. But I, lo- I, yeah. I think the mentality is the, is the right mentality. But the difference for you is okay. you have the option. Oh, okay. That's critical. Because if you just pulled the trigger or you met the right person or you just said, man, I woke up today and I'm going to do it. Uh-huh. You can do it, right? Mm-hmm. But I think it's like, okay, so all the business models that I've got, ever gotten to, yep. my Kindle books, yep. it's not like I'm buying a thousand books, having it in a warehouse, and Absolutely. then selling it. Absolutely. It's print on demand. Absolutely. My dropshipping stores, I'm not buying you know 100,000 worth of inventory or right. th- even 10,000 worth of inventory. Right. I'm just having it shipped as it as it comes. Absolutely. And with all these things, you know, even the pot, like podcasts, everything, all the, all my, divis- my, all my income streams, yeah. none of them, none of them cost more than like a thousand dollars absolutely to, to start up. Yeah. I think you're a smart, a smart man for doing that. You know, um, kind of looking at, at socioeconomics and this is more of a United States thing, but, I, but anybody who's from America, I think this applies. Um, I, I think the great equalizer for individuals and families is service businesses. And I think the reason for that is because the lack of capital intensity intensity that they have, mm-hmm. right? And and I think, um, and I'm not sure if you would probably classify it, but any business where you can risk minimal capital and get great returns, I think is a fantastic way to start. Mm-hmm. So I think the way that you did it is actually the ideal way to do it. Here's what I will say to that. Okay. What happens to the person who has the dream of doing that, who's taking the right first step, which is what you did? Okay. Um, uh, minimal risk, minimal capital up front, get a lot of cash in the bank and then figure it out later. That's the way to do it. But what happens when you're a guy like me and you couldn't pull off the internet marketing game okay. the way that you guys can do it? I'm not an e-commerce guy. Mm-hmm. Like uh, internet marketing is a piece of my business, not my whole business is though, right? So um, I, I don't really know much about Amazon. I don't know much about affiliate marketing. I tried that stuff, dude, and I was fucking miserable. Okay. Uh, excuse my language, I yeah. was terrible. And honestly, I think I think, and I don't know if you would agree with me, but probably ninety five percent of the people that are listening to this, this, um, or at least that are generally in the internet marketing space, aren't making a dime. I a, think a large portion. I think a lot of people listening are trying to figure something out. Yeah, probably, so, yeah, it's different here. Yeah, and, th- and that's why I'm really happy to to hear your perspective. Like, what do you think made it? I don't want to say easier because because I, I think both are gonna be just as hard. Yeah. But like, what made it like more comprehensible for you to start a business that you know? Your way versus like the the I don't want to say the online way because it uses online now, but oh, I understand. Yeah. Um, it's because um, I said I was going to do it. I said I was going to be an entrepreneur, and I said I was going to do it in whatever legal, ethical, moral fashion that looked like. Okay. And the thing that I worry about with with online marketers and internet marketers, um, many, not all, yeah. but many, is that when it doesn't work for you, do you have the depth? to roll to another model mm. that could be working for you mm-hmm. because now we're going to start an info product company. Okay. But dude, I have money in the bank and I have so much depth uh-huh. that, that if it fails, it could very well fail. But, um, the amount of tools and things I can draw from, like I know how to sell. Yeah. Right. And it's not just talking mechanically. I understand how to sell through the, all the way through the process. Uh-huh. So if I have an abandoned cart on my, on my site now where I wasn't able to do that before, I would have, I, and this is where I was failing. I could call that person uh-huh. and say, hey, what happened? Boom. Oh, this is why you did it. And then I can go make the tweaks on my website. Or um, if none of those internet marketing businesses fail for me, I'm still an entrepreneur mm. because I have a car business, I have a residential cleaning business, and I have a lodging business. So my thing is, if you're making a commitment to, to be an entrepreneur, don't just be an internet marketer or an affiliate marketer or an online entrepreneur. Be an entrepreneur. And it uses yeah, whatever tools. I can see that because as, yeah. as a true entrepreneur, you'll see opportunities and in you'll make any it work. Industry. Yeah. Absolutely. I, it's crazy now. Like when I watch things like Shark Tank, which I love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh The Profit. Have you oh seen God. That? Marcus Simonis, that's my dude. Man. Shout out to Marcus. Shout out to Marcus. <laughs> I see this and I'm like, I cannot believe how many businesses out there generate a million in revenue, but suck. Like the, the management oh, sucks. It's terrible. And like, and like these people are not entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And they still, just with grind and the hustle, Absolutely. still make it big. So I actually think that kind of more the traditional business route, mm-hmm. like the you know more offline business route or something that 
that causes capital to start, mm -hmm. like some of the businesses that you, you just mentioned, mm -hmm. I almost feel like people have a better chance of making that work mm. first because they are financially invested mm. where if it yeah. <laughs> isn't easy, they're like, well, I got to make it, I got to make this restaurant work. Dude, you ain't lying about that. No matter that. what. Yeah. You know, getting our lodging business, man. I mean, there, there were times where we were $50,000 in the hole. I mean, we, you know, we have 40, 50 K, you know, uh, I think like 40,000 a month in expenses right now or something like that. And, and it kind of fluctuates a little bit. Uh, but there have been times when we didn't hit the number mm. and we were taking significant losses and we were in the hole. Um, I couldn't just stop. I had to make that work. So I had to learn how to sell because I was like, I need more customers and I'm not converting. I was converting two out of every 10. Now I'm converting five to six out of every 10. And yeah. here's a very good example for people who don't quite understand that yet. Yeah. So another, the opposite business model or the, I don't know, like I guess like the digital nomad business model would yeah. be to be an affiliate for a travel site like Agoda Absolutely. where you can get a commission for sending people to a hotel, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. however I'm going to drive my traffic to you know get someone to book a hotel room, mm -hmm. If somebody books it, I'll get my commission. Maybe it's five percent or eight percent, or you know, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But if I don't book it and I don't have any customers that month, I don't really lose anything. Right. You know, I have my my web hosting, and I'm spending you know maybe a hundred bucks a month. Right. But that's it. Right. And if it doesn't work, ah, it doesn't work. Yeah. But in your model, you're committed <laughs> to forty, fifty grand a month. <laughs> so if you don't fill those rooms, you're like, I got to do whatever it takes to fill those rooms mm -hmm. so i think even though logically mm -hmm. it makes way more sense to not have that upfront cost or to have that fixed cost mm -hmm. if you can make if you can make both work mm -hmm. it makes more sense not to have those fixed expenses absolutely but i think way more people would succeed if they were financially invested and it's almost like more real like mm -hmm. if you like physically have seen the rooms you've been there you're like i want to rent these 10 rooms yeah right right you know you own those it just makes it easier for Sona to market versus like, okay, I'm going to send them to this travel website and then let them take care of it. Johnny, um, I think it even, uh, everything you said, I think is hundred percent right. I think um, the predecessor, one of the predecessors to what you were saying is the mindset. Uh, I had that mindset before any of these businesses started. I, you know, I declined job offers for many, many companies. I've lost family relationships because they thought I was crazy. And it sounds like you did too in, in certain instances mm -hmm. a couple years ago, right? Um, but I knew for me, this is the way that my life had to go. And I was, I had, you, if, if you have conviction, conviction and belief in your heart that this is the way that you were supposed to be living your life, then it's never, even if you don't have anything going on, it's never, oh, well, if it works and you don't say that when you have a kid, if you have a kid and, and the kid's crawling around and the kid needs healthcare, you're not going to say, oh, I mean, entrepreneurship and business is just like that. So I don't. I agree about the, the financially committed part, but honestly, I think someone's a, a, a fake if their mindset prior to even having those drivers come in, if they can just give up so easily. I, I think that I, I, there's something wrong with that because if you can yeah. give up that easily, what else would you give up? So I used to think that everyone in the world should be an entrepreneur because that's what worked for me. I'm happy as being an entrepreneur. Gotcha. And I think I've realized now, like not everyone, that's not everyone's calling. You know, some people would rather have a stable paycheck, yeah. even though most in my mind, <laughs> that's not stable at all <laughs> no, because no. I know as an entrepreneur, if one of my income streams dries up, I can just go make a new one Absolutely. versus if I get fired from my job, I get laid off. Absolutely. I'm screwed. Absolutely. I gotta go beg. <laughs> right? Writing a resume is like begging, walking to the office, is, putting dude. on a fucking you know, suit and tie that you don't want to be wearing. Absolutely. You know, just pretending you're someone else to, to get, you know, in this interview. It's like, I don't want to be that. Yeah. And you know what? I saw in, your, in the Nomad Summit, you said you'll never write a resume or a CV again. Never again. And guess what? You got a partner with you. I'm never going to write one either. Let's make that commitment. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? Let's shake All right. Back. I like it. <laughs> and people, you know what? You guys listening to this at home, if you guys want that bad enough, Get yourself to even a thousand dollars a month, absolutely, in online income, absolutely, and then promise yourself this is it. You know, I'm, I'm deleting my Word ninety five file, <laughs> my, my resume on there. Yeah, right. I'm never updating this again. Absolutely, deleting my LinkedIn. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, Johnny, there's there's something I do want to kind of speak about a little bit. Uh, it's something that's really dear to my heart when it comes to. Um, entrepreneurship. It's really this idea of economic independence. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really kind of my entrepreneurial, but kind of social platform. Um, you know, many of us being adults and, you know, especially in the United States, we think we're so independent and we're so free and control everything. That's a lie, right? In my opinion. 
And the reason I and the reason I say that is because of the definition, my definition of what economic independence is, because most of us are economically dependent, mm -hmm. primarily for the reasons that you just stated. You lose that income source. You're in the bread line mm -hmm. or you're calling a relative or you're going through a situation. Mm -hmm. It's not to knock those people, but let's not be confused about what it is. Right. I think economic independence is is the total control of the generation, the uh, management and the distribution of your wealth total control. Like you said, you're, if, if something happens with one of your businesses, you make the decision to roll into a new business, mm -hmm. right? Um, for, with us, we're in three different real industries, like, like physically in those industries. Um, uh, you know, if I was working in lodging and I was in corporate America, I would go into a car, I would go to car, a zip car or a car share company or even an old school Avis. Well, do you have any car rental experience? Have you ever worked in our industry? Ah, uh, we can't hire you because this guy's got car share experience. But as an entrepreneur, I don't, I don't have to give a shit about and that. You know what? <laughs> I could start it and never know of anything about it. Yeah. But I understand the underlying underlying mechanics of the money. And so here's another, <laughs> like another reason why our race doesn't matter when we're an entrepreneur You're is because right. people care about money and product. They don't care about your skin color, what you look like, how you dress. Nope. And if me or you walked in. To try to get a job at Avis, yeah, there's a good chance neither of us would get it. <laughs> no, you're right. We'd be walking out together. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be walking out together, going to lunch. But hey, man, can, can you help me out here? Can you? <laughs> you're right, man. That's insane. Like even with all the skills I have today, absolutely, they won't if, value. I, yeah, if I walked into an Avis, mm -hmm. dressed the way I'm dressed, mm -hmm. you know, and talking the way I talk, mm -hmm. they'll probably be like, I don't think, I don't think you're gonna work out here. <laughs> <laughs> they might look at your resume and be like. Desmond? Yeah. Nine? You know, we ain't calling this guy. Yeah. I, I haven't updated a resume in um, uh, 10 years. And I'm 31. That's 21, man. You did it. And, 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 and I'm, I'm saying that because I also think you're probably at that mark as well. And I say that as a badge of pride. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you can stay, and everything is not, see, I think people don't speak about the things that go wrong as an entrepreneur. $25,000 in the hole this month. I mean, I just am yeah. because we, we're coming out of a three month slump, mm -hmm. right? Um, and our business, you know, our business is cyclical and, you know, you know, kind of things happen. We're working ourselves out of that. Things are not peachy cream. I got to pay for general liability and specialty insurance with our lodging company. I got to pay for insurance with the car. But like, the, you know, I think entrepreneurs, like especially online marketers, I think it's great to start here, but eventually go, go do more things. Because here's the thing. If I would have just stuck to online marketing, dude, I'd be working a job. Yeah. See, I think we need to talk yep. about that. Because there's many that are like, okay, if I can't make this work, then then I just go get a job. But that's not really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But if you could go into a product, physical product, if it's got to be a physical product business, or if it's got to be a retail store, or if it's got to be a service business, if you are calling us to do be the owner, mm -hmm. then be the owner in whatever that looks like. And then do whatever it be, grind and do that in whatever way that that looks like so that you can then come back to this side of the world. Have enough runway. Because if you can lose money for 12 or 18 months trying to figure out the tweaks to your website or whatever, that's a much more better position to be in when you have replenishable income mm -hmm. that doesn't determine whether you're going to be there on the street here or not in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Right? So. De I definitely see that point. And I think this has been a good episode because it's shown people that it is possible to do to do both. To bootstrap a digital nomad type business. Yeah, absolutely. Or create a multi-million dollar, you know, or, or even or a million dollar offline business in the US, but make it location dependent. Absolutely. And I applaud you for that. Thank that's, you. That's amazing. Thank you. Same I, to you. Yeah. Just curious, uh, employee situation, do you have, do you have VA, do you have employees uh, full time back in the US? Was it just the two of you? What's going on? No, that's a great question. So we have a team of 12. Okay. Um, we had a larger team. We had to cut, cut a couple of VAs because the quality kind of mm -hmm. wasn't there. Um, and we had increased our requirements so that just wasn't working out. But uh, let's see, out of that 12, um, seven are full-time um, or like traditional independent contractors or employees full-time and then the other five are VAs. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're a team in total with her and I are 14 right now. So the, the ones that are full-time, are they all in Atlanta or are they diverse? Kind of yeah, you've got um, three in Atlanta, uh, one in Ohio, uh, one in Florida, one in Texas, um, and another one in California. Then when you start looking abroad, you've got Venezuela, Philippines, wow. India. So yeah, it's kind of diverse. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that's cool. Yeah, okay. it's cool, man. Uh, managing people is interesting. Yeah. Uh, looking at compensation, contracts, paying people, that's a whole different animal. So it's cool, though. I, I, I like it. So Desmond, you're, you're a smart guy. Oh, thanks, dude. You're successful. But I think you also have a good head on your shoulders in a sense where you're not just there stacking money, buying Lamborghinis. 
you know, <laughs> popping bottles at the club. <laughs> like you're traveling, you're, you know, immersing this experience. And I think a lot of people should look up to people like you. Like if I was a young black kid growing up in Atlanta and I, hear, I heard this interview, I'd be like, you know what? I could do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they absolutely can. Yeah. You know, um, I think that many of these things are not native talents. Uh, I think people were like, I, I even find this when I hire people. They're like, oh, well, that, but, but you're different. Uh, no, I actually think that you're different as well. Let's step your game up and let's get this cranking, right? I think a lot of times because people have been held to a subpar way of thinking and um, level of achievement, especially when it comes to their money, achieving with their money and putting their money at risk because, you know, you can go be a great academic. I got buddies who are PhDs at some of the greatest schools, probably like you do, right? Nope. You, uh, <laughs> well, I'm just saying we all have some yeah, level yeah. of connection, yeah, yeah, right? Of course, right? yeah, yeah. Um, but if you put those same people in this world, they'll drown. Yeah, I see that. They yeah. will drown. They don't know what to do. I know I have clients that are executives at, at pretty big companies that I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, they're going to do great as an entrepreneur. They drown yep. because they are, they have been so disconnected from the operational duties it takes to start something from scratch and not being able to delegate and call their personal assistant that they can't even operate here. Mm -hmm. They don't even understand what it means to not have an expense car. I mean, that means something when you're like you do when you're traveling on your own dime. You got to do shit a little differently. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> a lot differently. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. I, yeah. So, I, you know, that's actually another benefit of being an entrepreneur is when you do like everything I put on my card. Yeah. And I'm like. Do I really need to? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Because you actually start being, it almost forces you to be more financially conservative. Yep. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. Yes. Yeah. It's coming out of your pocket. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I like it. So, Desmond, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, Thank you. How can people reach you? Yeah, just check me out at desmondlanders.com. Okay. D-E-Z-M-O-N-L-A-N-D-E-R-S.com. Um, That's really where I kind of talk about economic independence and talk about um, uh, the general aspects of entrepreneurship from my experience. Okay. Are you on Twitter or any social media or anything? Um, I'm on Instagram. Okay. Just Desmond Landers. I'm on Facebook. Okay. Desmond Landers. Yeah. I don't do a lot with social media. We were talking about that before, but okay. I will start probably more in 2018. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Busy uh, stacking that cash. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trying to make sure it doesn't run away. You know how that goes. Uh, <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank you guys for listening to another episode. Uh, this week is sponsored by tripstreak.com, the smarter travel search. Thank you guys for using them if you want to book your next hotel or your next flight and I'll see all of you guys next week thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast if you want to hear more including the bonus how to choose the perfect niche episode join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com see you next week and remember if you want to travel like a boss you need to be your own boss so start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of